Welcome to our webinar on behavioral modeling related to mechanics of modeling of non-maturity deposit. This webinar will be divided in three parts. The first part is related strictly to the reason of modeling. Why do we model? items without deterministic maturity, what is the impact of incorrect assumptions, and what is the regulatory landscape as uh, regards this product, this product category. And then the second one will be um, related to the mechanics of modeling. So we will analyze every single component of model or for a non-maturity deposit. We will be talking about the rate sensitivity on non-maturity deposit, balance volatility, so how to uh, divide the non maturity deposit into core and non core, stable, non stable. What does it mean exactly? And what is the average life of the product? How can we estimate or forecast the trajectory of our non maturity deposit product? And finally, in the last part, we'll be talking about the funds transfer pricing and pricing of non-maturity deposit. So uh, we will be allocating the price to this product, but from two different angles. So for, first of all, we'll be reflecting the interest rate risk component in, uh, in the price. And the second one will be uh, recognizing the liquidity premium to this product and the tenor which this product should be uh, should be having um, because it is obviously the liquidity value. This product is extremely important. It is the cheap source of funding for the banks and therefore the correct recognition of its liquidity value is of utmost importance. Then there are obviously many challenging in modeling non-maturity deposit and there are many models. Today we will analyze only one of them and I will show you uh, as an example how to uh, how can we approach in a simple way modeling of uh, NMDs. Obviously more uh, sophisticated bank a more sophisticated methodology could be required, although there is the strict regulatory requirement related to the fundamentals of modeling. And we will tackle this issue as well. Um, please remember that if you, if you don't have any model or you don't believe your model uh, is reflecting the reality. It is especially the case for some currencies or like, for example, in Europe, we have the negative rates. So calibration of the models which have been uh, created in times when the rates were positive is really difficult because we don't have the time series long enough to reflect the behavior of the um, of the <clears throat> depositors when uh, based on this uh, you know on this time series and we don't know what will happen when the rates start to go up so this is uh, this is one of the most important challenge for the european market for example therefore a regulator comes up with um, its own regulatory factors, both for balance uh, volatility, both for rate sensitivity and for the average life for the product. And those caps, like we call it or like a regulator calls them, are supposed to, uh, to be a benchmark for modeling of NMDs. So the regulatory landscape is very important because if you don't have your own model or you don't uh, apply the expert judgment or you don't 
believe that your expert judgment could reflect the reality and changes in the market, then you will support yourself with the regulatory requirements, which is mainly the Basel 368 document. And we'll be talking about it quite in detail. So uh, let's start for the reason of non-maturity deposit. So non-maturity deposit is a product which don't have any maturity, contractual maturity allocated. And uh, it can be all saving account, savings account, it can be check account, it can be current account. So you have different uh, the categories of this product and every category has its own characteristics which cannot be underestimated one while uh, during the modeling process because obviously they have different behavior the client and the, of those cohorts of those segments have different behavior and uh, we said that there is many um, the impact on uh, on the interest rate risk and on the liquidity risk. And I would like to show you right now what is the main, how it impact the, no, the interest rate risk position, uh, our modeling of NMDs. Non-maturity deposit, uh, if we model them too short, so we allocate to this product short maturity, or within let's say one year then on the short part of the curve the bank will be obviously liability sensitive and will be exposed to the upward movement of the curve so we will create the nii sensitivity so modeling them too short will have impact on the first irbb metrics which is delta nii or nii volatility we learn about those metrics in the IRBB module, uh, IRBB webinar. If we want to model them too long, and this is the tendency which the banks do, uh, they try to allocate the longer duration to this product, then we can have the situation where on the long part of the curve, the bank will be behaving as a net liability position. So it means that the <clears throat> upward, in case of the upward movement of the deposit, of the, of the rates, there will be the impact on the value of those deposits. And uh, the loss of value in current accounts uh, can create the EVE sensitivity. So they will be the impact on the second metric, which is the medium long part of the curve and the metric to estimate this portion of the curve. So we have the impact or if model longer, we have impact on EVE, on PV01, on the duration gap. And obviously, if we, we use the, um, the, the dynamic metrics, they will be impact as well. And if we model them too short, then we have impact on the NIA sensitivity. So uh, where should we draw the line? What should be the right uh, duration of this product? Please remember also that the, <clears throat> the non-maturity deposit very often are used in two things. The first one is the natural hedging. Natural hedging is to use the outstanding of non-maturity deposit and to offset the sensitivity, time bucket sensitivity, which is arising from fixed rate asset and to offset it through this non-maturity deposit. Let's imagine we have the asset five years maturity, five years duration, overall duration. And then we, uh, we have obviously the uh, exposure to the upward movement of the curve because the upward movement of the curve will create the loss in economic value of the bank. But 
then we try to offset it um, more through modeling the non-maturity deposit up to five years of average duration. So it means that in this case, we will offset the sensitivity, uh, the time bucket sensitivity, and we'll mitigate also the duration gap, uh, duration gap, if any, uh, <clears throat> if we have any. In this case, if we have the five years fixed rate asset, we have the obvious duration gap, a positive duration gap. So uh, this um, artificial modeling of this product, given that it is artificial, has to be as accurate as possible, because otherwise we will be underhedged or overhedged. And this is a real problem because the hedging is expensive. So if we, in the same example, if we um, model, um, let's say artificially, and it's inaccurate, um, the non-maturity deposit up to five, up to two years, then obviously we will get some portion from two years to five years, which is open position. And this open position will need to be mitigated, to be hatched, uh, to be offset. Usually the bank will use the swaps, which will uh, mitigate the exposure to the upward movement of the curve. Therefore, uh, we will take on some, we'll expense to, uh, for, for the hedging costs and we'll, we'll pay for the hedging costs. So, uh, hedging is expensive and we will entering also into swaps has some in some additional uh, effects because there is the uh, collateral there is the impact on the short tactical liquidity short term liquidity in terms of collateral and there are um, many accounting from the accounting perspective we need to um, to be in the under the test effectiveness, so we need to pass the effect effectiveness test, and we need to monitor it. We need to have the models. We need to have the operational structure and processes in order to keep in place those hedges. Uh, if we model the uh, current accounts too long, then we will have the opposite position the opposite position in terms that we will be showing that we are the net liability position so we will be exposed to the downward movement of the uh, medium long part of the curve and in this case uh, we will have eve impact and probably we will say that we need to put uh, to take some swaps, uh, receiver swaps, in order to uh, offset the position on, uh, in this case, the open gap, the open risk position. So again, the impact is, uh, is huge. Uh, you can be over or under hedged if you don't model it correctly. So um, model, when you, if you build the uh, non-maturity deposit model, you need to uh, frequently test it, frequently calibrate it. Every single model has always the model documentation, uh, but it is not only related to the non-maturity deposit, it is also related to uh, every single model which you have in place in IRBB, liquidity space, ILM, treasury, you need to, to write the deposit manual and deposit mo documentation. The model will be tested, the model will be validated by the third party. And this is something which has been required by the uh, recent regulation. Uh, in the space of IRBB, uh, again, I'm referring to the Basel uh, 368, which requires uh, those models uh, to be uh, tested and validated by the third party. Um, it is not easy to model uh, this product because 
it is very dynamic. So when the rates go up, um, and if the, the rates go up to some extent, the customer behaves um, at certain way, in certain way. Then over this level, the client start to change its behavior and start to, uh, you know, it depends if it's the rate shopper or if there's someone who is uh, um, loyal to the bank, is keeping the money within the bank since 30 years, uh, is not going to withdraw it, uh, even though the rates are going up, and he could put it in another bank and earn additional return. He won't do it. This is the kind of product, of kind of customer, which we call it the lazy client or lazy customers or lazy money. So those clients won't withdraw, but there are some, uh, like for example, uh, savings accounts class customers, which are extremely sensitive to the interest rate movement, and they will withdraw the money if you don't um, reprice the product. What does it mean, reprice the product? If you don't pay them more, they will go, they will leave the bank and they will go to shop for another rate. So Basel, uh, basically, um, we have these three different standards, which I'm showing you here, which um, are ex explicitly saying about the behavioral modeling. So the first one is obviously the standards, uh, Basel standards and interest rate risk in the banking book. And um, Mm, this is the first uh, attempt of giving the coefficient from the regulatory side, which you can potentially use uh, for the standardized approach for IRBB. And you can, uh, if you don't have any model and you think that your mm, clients um, behave in a certain way, which uh, you can approximate by those coefficients, then you can go with this model, use the coefficient from the Basel. And the next one is the final report, the guidelines on the management of the interest rate risk arising from non-trading activities, which is reflecting um, uh, reflecting exactly the Basel uh, standards. And uh, here, uh, let me say another thing. Before the um, standards which came uh, uh, into law, came, no, it is not a law. Basel is not a law. It is just a, a recommendation because Basel is never a law. It is recommendation. It is the best practice benchmark, but it's not requirement. Meanwhile, the um, European Banking Authority report, this final report is a requirement or the, uh, let's say, PRA um, from the um, UK perspective is also the requirement. But all those requirements um, are based on the, on the Basel and uh, quite often um, the national regulator is, um, is to mirror the standards, Basel standards. All of those of those regulations, even if they they can differ from the standards on IRBB, um, they expect banks to have the proper behavior analysis in place for those items, and um, this is because the ma many banks worldwide are funded with non-maturity deposit, and the way in which Mm, the average, average lives uh, is modeled, has significant implementations and implications uh, when you estimate the value effectiveness in the management of interest rate risk. <clears throat> so um, there is the difficulty in the modeling of expected remaining life because uh, of the fact that deposit balance behavior is not necessarily monotonically mono, mm, decreasing. Uh, excuse me, it may decrease or increase at any point of time. And this is again 
associated associated with um, with multiple factors, and those factors uh, are different. There is a number of factors which can impact the behavior of customers, and we'll be going through them. So, for this reason, there is the clear requirements towards deep analysis of the client behavior. So, it's not always monotonically decreasing or monotonically increasing. It is uh, sometimes exponential. It is, um, it is the function which is not linear. So uh, depends on different factors. And those factors, to, to identify those factors is a first, a key thing in our analysis. So let's have a look at the Basel uh, model, um, the methodological details of Basel. So Basel have um, the segmentation allocation of non-maturity deposit according to the to the following scheme. So we have the uh, retail non-maturity deposit and wholesale non-maturity deposit. The segmentation according Basel is quite simple. So they don't um, segment it through the statistical analysis like I will show you in, in this webinar, um, many banks do. So they allocate the segmentation scheme which is based on the statistical assumptions. Here they just divide it into retail and wholesale portion and the balance which is uh, lower of 1 million euro or higher of 1 million euro uh, is determinant in this analysis. So if you are lower than 1 million of euro then you are retail. If you are higher than 1 million of euro then you have wholesale and this is the only way of segmentation proposed by Basel. Um, then you, uh, once you identify the seg segments, you divide them in two parts, the stable and non-stable. The stable portion is the client who will remain within the, within the bank for the longer time period. Uh, they will remain for, uh, um, for example, if you, more, if you allocate to this product maturity of five years, they will remain for the five years uh, or ev on average, on average. But within this category, we need to differentiate again the two subcategories. The first one is the core non-maturity deposit product, which is a very stable portion and which can be considered from the IRBB perspective fixed rate uh, funding. So it is long term and fixed rate because you, you don't pay or you pay some rate but for this duration you don't reprice this product this category subcategory and this is why it is fixed rate instead the second category is the rate sensitive non-maturity deposit so from the liquidity perspective it is long-term funding but from the interest rate risk perspective it is floating rate product why? Because if you don't want to lose those clients, you need to reprice them to pass through the rates increase in the market. So if the rates increase, you will acknowledge or recognize to those clients, to this group, subgroup of client, some portion of this rate increase. For example, 30%. Otherwise, if you don't, you will lose them. So the banks are conscious that um, they are aware of this group of clients which are rate sensitive and which will uh, move to other bank if they don't reprice. So there is always some portion of 
uh, of st stability, but subject to if you reprice to the certain extent. Now, to understand what should be the extent of repricing is um, is the holy gray in uh, in uh, grail in the modeling of non-maturity deposit because it depends on the pricing strategy of the bank it depends on the senior management it depends on your uh, risk appetite and uh, first of all on the commercial strategy because do you want to lose those clients if you don't reprice or how much to which extent you rely on those clients in funding strategy so if you rely to the significant extent then you have to reprice uh, 60 percent or 50 percent of the rates increase otherwise you will do a lower pass-through rate pass-through rate is the this recognition of the movement in the market to the client and this is known pass through rate and there is non stable portion the non stable portion is um the portion which is known volatile portion or hot money it is something which uh, will from the liquidity perspective will leave the bank within the next 30 days or even less and from the interest rate risk perspective is repricing on overnight basis so the buzzer is dividing into stable non-stable stable core sensitive and then provides us with the coefficient so it's saying to which Mm, time bucket we need to allocate those product so for example the core portion will be allocated to the time band subject to the basel caps and there are some caps for example it's five years average maturity as far as retail clients ask, are concerned and 4.5 as far as wholesale clients are concerned so um, they uh, provide us with the caps you cannot go over five years or 4.5 yeah and theoretically you will tell me yes i have good explanation for sure my clients behave um much better which are much longer stay, are staying longer are more sticky so i i, I don't uh, i don't want to underestimate uh, this number the stickiness number so i'm going to allocate it to the longer time buckets it is decision of the bank but it has to be really well documented i'm not saying that you are not allowed to model them longer than five years because Basel is saying you cannot do it no Basel is proposing you the caps which needs to be done under standardized approach for IRBB you can model them according your own assumptions but you need to have the good justification of those number those numbers here we are talking about Basel for now so i'm going to tell you what are the requirements of basel so we have those two caps uh, five years and 4.5 and those will be allocated according to the simple approach and according simple approach you will do it linearly you will split them linearly by time bucket so for example in the some portion if you have um st core 100 of core and uh, you will have a 19 time bucket in your repricing gap then you will divide it equally by every time bucket this uh, uh, this amount so 100 divided by 19 and this is the amount which will be allocated to every single amount according this approach and uh, this rate sensitive portion has to be allocated to over nine time bucket so um it is 
interesting from the interest uh, from the interest rate perspective because it's quite conservative uh, if you think that uh, your rate sensitive portion is um repricing every three months or is mimicking the LIBOR three months, then uh, you are not going to, you know, allocation to overnight and bucket of this portion is quite uh, conservative. This is because uh, if you remember um, in the IRBB webinar, we spoke about the time factor, which is important in the NII sensitivity calculation. So uh, here for the overnight time bucket, we have the time factor, which is uh, significant and it will increase your time bucket sensitivity. So the closest day of repricing, the higher NII sensitivity. So in this case, overnight time bucket is quite conservative. Then we have the non-stable, which I understand why the regulator suggests to put it to the overnight time bucket, because obviously it's not stable. So we are not going to rely on, on this product. And from the liquidity perspective, it's short term. From the IRBB perspective, it is, uh, it is overnight repricing. So just to summarize what the Basel is saying, what is also reflected in the final report of EB, European Banking Authority, BA, they are, um, let's say, dividing for the IRBB purpose. This is important to have the split between the interest rate risk component and liquidity component. And this is important from FTP and pricing perspective. And you will see later how important it is. So from interest rate is perspective, you have this split. So you have the two segments, two segments which are determined, which are developed on the, based on the outstanding uh, of money which client or balances of um, which clients keeps within the bank. It can be different total liabilities which the client have with the bank. And uh, so, like for example, current uh, accounts plus savings accounts is the total number. And then you will divide it uh, into stable and non-stable. Uh, the stable from the IRBB purposes divides further into the core balances, which are known also structural balances. And I will show you soon what does it mean? What is the second important point uh, for modeling, uh, correct modeling of those items? Uh, because the first one was the impact on EVE and NII metrics. The second one is the hedging, structural hedging, but it's, it's, it will come later. So uh, the second part is the rate sensitivity and the rate sensitivity from the IRBB perspective will be allocated to overnight. Non-stable is allocated to overnight. This is exactly what regulator is asking for under standard approach. In the reality, um, you have always, the banks have always their own models, which they think they can justify sufficiently in front of the regulator. So uh, they will use those models in the LM systems and you will, they will use them on to, um, on the management view for IRBB, daily IRBB management, mitigation, hedging, so on and so forth. So they will be using it in all analyses which they have, ILM analysis. So they will have the one standardized approach, which is required by Basel. And they will have the second one, which is the statistical model or econometric model, which uh, is more or less complex and will be used in the daily management of LM risks also from liquidity perspective. Now, <clears throat> the modeling have, um, the modeling has impact on at least um, 
five different areas of banking. So the first one is the match funds transfer pricing. So this is, I already mentioned that the core portion of deposit is considered like fixed rate, medium long term funding. This is because the, um, those clients are particularly stable. They are sticky. They are not going to leave the bank for the different reason. And let's leave apart those reasons for now. And um, the duration of this product will be equal to the duration of, um, of the core NIPCA non-interest bearing current accounts. Now let me explain. So NIPCA non-interest bearing current accounts are all outstandings which you use in the uh, operational transactional current accounts. What is the transactional current account? Transactional current account is the account which you use for uh, for daily management of your budget. For example, the salary goes there. For example, you have the mortgage uh, installment there. So you are paying your mortgage through this account. So there is every every single daily activity is converging to this uh, to this account so this is transactional account because you, and you don't you are not recognized uh, any rate it is the common practice you don't have any rate you have zero rate on those products and those balances and still you keep them this is uh, uh, the nipka balance and this is uh, absolutely um cons absolutely the most important let's say poor part of deposits because it is uh, the part which is used for structural hedging for match funding for uh, pv uh, time bucketing sensitivity for um funding management you it will be a benchmark also for the pricing for acknowledgement of the liquidity premium to those product so uh, the NIPCA balances are uh, important to to our ILM risks to mo to management uh, of daily ILM risk, and uh, it can be used in the match funding process. So by match funding, uh, I mean natural hedging, or you uh, go through. Uh, you are closing the time bucket sensitivity uh, using those balances. So this is what is meant by match funding. So you match the um, duration of your asset with the duration of your liabilities. And it is for every single time bucket, because remember, when you are talking about the average duration of liabilities, you don't mean it is bullet. Bullet, it means that one, in one only time bucket. It is distributed um, accordingly by time bucket. So you will find some portion in one time bucket, second, and so on and so forth. So this is, Ev on average, you will get the uh, the maturity of five years, for example, and the, you will try to mimic the duration of your assets. This is match funding. So, uh, as a portion of stable funding, it will improve uh, regulatory and internal liquidity metrics and funding quality of the bank. What do I mean? In the webinar on asset liability management optimization, we went through different metrics, liquidity metrics. And one of those metrics was were, were structure liquidity limit, which is stable funding divided by non-liquid asset. And by st stable funding, we mean all funding which is beyond one year. Uh, with the expiration, uh, residual expiration date beyond one year. This is the stable funding. And those NIPCA uh, definitely are, uh, are meant uh, as a stable funding. They form stable funding. So they will improve our structural ratio. They will give more stability in our funding uh, base. And also we have the net stable funding ratio, regulatory 
requirements which uh, which recognize the stability of this product we have the lcr which again is the short term liquidity metric but uh, it will allocate the uh, lower outflow to this product because of the stickiness so um, this is all um, where those metrics where this uh, stickiness um, improves our metrics there is uh, uh, eve which if you model them as i said if you have this nipka you can use it to uh, to hedging through na to natural hedging strategy and then we have the as i said uh, interest rate risk uh, management so this is one and another two uh, two points which are one is from the the, the match funding is mostly from uh, from the liquidity perspective and the irbb perspective aspect is also there but here when we are talking about the irbb management for nipka we are talking mainly about the economic value of equity and duration gap analysis so this core part of current accounts will help you in achievement of the immunization strategy so the lower the duration gap the lower exposure to the structural interest rate risk so the l fixed term risk um, i said in irbb webinar that the structural interest rate is exposure is the most dangerous one because it is something which can destroy your value your the, your, your bank totally over years because it is exactly what forms the um the value have the impact on the uh, embedded value of your banking book so this is uh this is this stable uh portion which of the of current accounts which helps you to immunize if you have the long duration of assets to uh, minimize the exposure to structural risk and this is known like immunization strategy so you achieve it through um, uh, through um, through the, the structural accounts so structural balances then uh, obviously you have the pricing uh, as I said, in pricing, we have two different components. So the output of uh, deposit characterization modeling. So uh, we will be a modeling of deposits. I call it here for the sake of this presentation, deposit characterization model. So it means that we will be uh, providing the characteristics from the rate sensitivity, balance volatility, average life of the product to uh, non maturating deposits so this is uh, why i call it here in this presentation deposit characterization model and you can quite often hear this word uh, for uh, for modeling so the output of this model will provide you with um, the appropriate allocation of the interest rate risk component so this risk-free component so what do i mean by this uh, interest rate risk component imagine that your um, your uh, non-maturity deposit the rate sensitive portion you determined according to your model is repricing every three months so then what will be the benchmark for the interest rate risk component for this portion of the product it will be libor free months and it will be uh, the risk free component the irbb component for this portion instead you will have some longer term uh, portion which is sticky and which will get the term liquidity component which uh, reflects as we know the bank's own credit spread in funds transfer pricing so uh, the experience of uh, the past behavior of your customer base is extremely important not only for liquidity for irbb but also for pricing for the future pricing of those products because we will recognize them some liquidity component and uh, if you 
um, analyze the I, the funds transfer pricing webinar, you 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 remember that I was clearly mentioning that there is the link between <coughs> the liquidity uh, recognition of the liquidity premium and pricing of. Uh, of the product, not only non-maturity deposit. So for the liabilities, so you have this uh, also for time depot, for example, the behavioralization of those product, uh, behavioralization, so the allocation of some uh, recognition of some additional liquidity value to those product because of the rollover in term in terms of time in, in the case of time depot you are talking about rollover because some portion of those products will roll over and will give you uh, the the future funding resources uh, and then you will recognize it's that in reality it is not only the three months uh, liability it is let's say six month liability or one year liability so you have to behavioralize through the analysis statistic analysis and will recognize the additional liquidity value which the product brings to the bank so this is the concept of FTP and the pricing uh, fundamental aspect in the in the pricing of liabilities uh, then we have the structural hedging. The structural hedging is something which uh, I definitely uh, need to enter into detail. Uh, for now, I only mentioned that the core part of deposit along with equity forms these structural balances which I use in the structural hedging program. And the structural hedging program is put in place to mitigate the margin compression and how we get it as i said this how we um put in place this strategy or undertake this strategy it will be explained very soon now uh, funding uh, management <clears throat> is also very important because deposit uh, are considered from the from the treasury perspective uh, a high quality cheap funding and you know the deposit base uh, and the liability center is looking for the products which can uh, provide them higher PL. so if you um, let's say pay to your de depositors one percent um, for uh, three years deposits and then uh, you will be recognized by ILM three years funding value of funding which in the market let's say let's imagine is five percent then your PNL will be two percent it will be five percent minus I said one so it's four percent so this is um, this is important in term of funding management so you will uh, you you will want to have uh, the deep knowledge of the customer behavior you want to know their sensitivity to the external internal factors in order to also to project your funding plan to write your funding plan and to understand to which extent you can rely on those sticky funding in the future and for your new business strategy now um, let's uh, uh, make some general consideration about structural hedging uh, so as i said savings and, and non-interest bearing deposits plus free reserve uh, have traditionally um, provided a significant part of the net interest income uh through hedging through structural hedging so the structural hedging was the um, enhancement profitability tool so it had the additional it made money for the bank this tool now it's not any more so attractive for the different aspects first of all for the accounting of those pro of of this uh this hedges and the second because it's very strict now from the accounting perspective and the second one because of the rates 
the, the, the level of the rates is low. And so it's obviously not um, attractive anymore to enter into this kind, kind of hedging uh, with all the constraints coming from the accounting perspective. But before, uh, on the historical basis, historically, it was one of the important sources of additional PL for the LM. So now we have the uh, persistent low interest rate environments, which uh, has driven the margin down. And in order to mitigate normally the tool for the mitigation of the margin compression from a lower rate environment, so the banks try to lock the margins, lock in the margins by investing in uh, in um, in derivatives or in assets matching the expected behavior maturity repricing uh, of NIPCA or also of interest bearing current accounts. So, um, <clears throat> but in order to to have this strategy, so yeah, you, you are um, mirroring the the assets in order to. Um, uh, or you, you invested for the asset for the term you think your liability lives for, for example, three years, two years. And this is because you want to lock in the margin and you want to match the, the behavior of your liabilities. Um, as I said, um, it is not easy because uh, this uh, reinvestment strategies needs to be done on the fundamentals which are very valid. So you need to, to have assumptions for the average life of the product and you need to have assumptions in terms of the velocity of decay of the product. And also, you know, there is some additional, uh, additional consideration Mm, because when the, mm, the post-crisis environment, uh, in the post-crisis environment, we know that there is significant amount of NIPCA in the, on the bank, in the banks. So those accounts are there because we don't have any additional, uh, mm, you know, possibilities to invest those money. So quite, mm, a lot of clients leave those balances in the banks in in order to wait for them for the better uh, market and for the better environment but uh, once the rates start to grow up uh, obviously we are we think that uh, we i mean the ilm practitioners thinks that it will be uh, impacting very strongly the behavior of the client and then um, the significant portion of these balances would potentially live. So uh, we uh, assess the, the, the model of your, of your current account based on the current situation, but the situation will be changed uh, very soon once the rates start to go up. So the, uh, the the hedging, this, but let's come back to the uh, structural hedge. So the structural hedging is the mechanism to protect the bank against the margin compression. And the banks, we said, we had, was doing it historically in order to enhance the uh, profitability of ILM. So there were two reasons for doing the structural hedging. The first one was to mitigate the margin compression and the second one was to earn money on this. And we can see uh, on the graph that uh, years ago uh, the swaps rates, pre-crisis swaps rates were five, six percent. So imagine that in that environment <clears throat> and different a regulatory landscape less heavy you uh, you would hurt your long term liabilities or structural liabilities with swaps uh, with the receiver swaps 
So you will be entering into the interest rate swap receiver. So you will be receiving the fixed rate on the asset side and you will be paying the floating rate on the liability side. And so you'll be transforming your uh, fixed rate liabilities into the floating rate liabilities and <clears throat> your uh, time bucket sensitivity will be offset through those swaps. But additionally, you will be receiving the six five six percent for free five years because the uh, time horizon for those swaps were three five years. So you imagine that you enter into the three five year swaps and you will be getting for three six uh, for three or five years the the uh, the the five percent on annual basis. And against what? Against almost zero paid on structural balances. So we'll, it will be almost all profit on your side. And even more, if the rates start to go suddenly down, you locked in the 5-6%. So from ILM perspective, you ensured your profitability for first five years and you mitigated the interest, uh, the margin compression, the potential margin compression, which could be faced uh, when the rates suddenly go down. Obviously, now you can see that the, uh, the rates went significantly down and now they are even negative in, in the Euro market. So, but in all markets, they are much lower than the pre-crisis level. So, uh, you obviously understand that this um, structural hedging plus the heavier uh, accounting standards not allowing any more or less uh, discouraging this kind of practice. And uh, however, it is important to keep in mind that it was one of the uh, most important strategies to enhance the profitability and to mitigate the, um, the, ta the margin compression. So the mechanism of the margin compression, which you can see here, is again to, uh, to convert the fixed or near fixed, we are calling it near fixed liability exposure, so those structural exposures, into the floating rate. Yeah. So on the asset side, imagine you have the uh, prime link floating rate received on asset, rates received on assets. And on the liability side, you have this fixed structural rate, uh, which is almost zero. And now the rates are going down, down and down. And you can see that the margin starts to become compressed. And you cannot do anything because you cannot, theoretically, you can, but from the practical perspective, you cannot reprice below zero your liabilities, so your deposits, because you will lose simply your client. And hedging will transform this left side situation, which is causing the margin compression and PL has the PL negative impact into the a mitigated situation from the risk perspective. So on the asset side, you see that you have those still those floating rate assets, prime link floating rate asset. And on the liability side, you have this LIBOR link floating rate on liabilities because through the swap, you are receiving fixed rate on asset and paying floating on liabilities. And therefore, you have this margin stable, you close it. So you close it, you, you achieve the stability of the margin. And there is, however, something which you need to worry in this situation is the basis risk. Because you can see that you have this risk factor on asset side, which is the prime rate, we spoke about the prime index rate products in the interest rate risk webinar and the LIBOR uh, link 
uh, on liabilities are not moving in this uh, are not perfectly correlated so uh, they will m be moving uh, by the different extent and there will be some portion of time then there, there, there can be some negative impact coming from those movements um, so uh, let's summarize the uh, structural hedge uh, we have those balances which are which we call structural balances. Uh, those balances are structural deposits. And uh, so the NIPCA, the core portion of current accounts, where you have the stickiness in short, and you have the equity. Uh, because it's also the some portion of funding. It is, it is funding. It is the source of funding. And uh, Obviously, those are long-term funding. So in this way, you will be hedging against those balances through swaps. And uh, how to identify those structural balances in the sense of um, how much structural, of how much, what is the core portion of deposit is fundamental because you will be hedging against this portion. So if you tell that it is too much, too much, for example, 80% and in, instead in the reality you have only 50, you made a mistake on your structural hedging strategy. So you will be obviously um, in this case over hedged uh, and vice versa. The same if you uh, if you just uh, underestimated your uh, core portion.